we're talking about Cytonorm. Um, this is a package that was published by Sophie Van Gassen um, a few years ago. And uh, I have to say that um, <clears throat> we put this plugin together. I don't know, gosh, it seems like we put it together a couple of years ago and um, it's, you know, it's gotten some use, but, you know, we just haven't done uh, webinars on it, I suppose. So <clears throat> why would you develop a normalization package for, uh, for flow or mass cytometry? Well, <clears throat> I think we all know the answer to that question because we, know we have to normalize in other techniques that we use in the lab. And the primary reason for that is we want to uh, minimize batch effects that may occur uh, you know, during acquisition of our samples. So this is particularly important for longitudinal studies. So anything where you're collecting samples over a long period of time, right? You've got a, let's say a day zero, right? Then you have like a you know, one month time point, a three month time point, six months, two years, whatever the case may be. It doesn't matter how long or how short. The point is you're collecting samples across uh, various times. And generally speaking, you know, you're going to see that there's some variability between those samples collected at those different times. And it may not be due to biological differences in the samples, but simply uh, the fact that they were collected on different days. So if you can imagine the figure on the right here kind of shows you uh, that concept, right? You have a batch or a run, let's say time point one, represented in green, time point two represented in orange, and time point three uh, collection represented in purple, you know, and, uh, you know, these samples, let's assume they haven't been stimulated or anything. You're just collecting blood, let's say, over uh, three different time points. And when you do the data analysis, you can see that, oh, you know, the sample that was collected in, you know, time point one has a low level of marker expression, whatever the marker is. Uh, you know, sample number two seems to have high level of expression, and then uh, sample number three is somewhere in between. If you were to do more fancy analysis like PCA or TISNI or something, you would notice that these populations sort of, you know, kind of group or separate out, uh, you know, into different sections of the graph, kind of indicating that, you know, there's some difference between them when in reality, uh, you know, they should be uh, very similar to one another. So those differences that you see in these, you know, in the data analysis steps here are simply due to technical artifacts known as batch effects. And where do this, you know, so where does this technical variability or where do these batch effects come from? Well, uh, number one, they can come from um, instruments. So, you know, you have a series of instruments in your lab, obviously one instrument may be different uh, from another, even if it's the same brand, you know, the configuration can be different, but even, you know, even if the configurations are the same, for whatever reason, the power of, you know, one laser on one machine is slightly higher than the power on another. And, uh, you know, that, that is going to be a source of variability. Also the reagents, you know, obviously if you have different lots on different days, there is gonna be some variability uh, between the reagent lots. And then of course, another big source of variability is going to be how the samples are processed. So obviously you cannot have, you know, the same, same people uh, in different sites at the same time, right? Let's say on the West Coast, you have a facility and, uh, you know, you have a group of people there processing samples in that facility. And then on the East Coast, you have another set of people processing samples. Now, even though you might have the same protocols, the fact that it's in different hands is going to give rise to uh, increased variability. And so this technical variability can confound the results, you know, um, confound the biological uh, variability that may or may not be present in those samples. So this slide just kind of goes over those uh, sources of technical uh, uh, variability. A lot of publications have been written to help minimize, you know, these, these batch effects. Um, but, you know, again, it's probably impossible to remove batch effects in, in, if, uh, in their entirety. And again, the sources are instrument and how you process the samples. Um, some of these solutions are obviously to try and uh, standardize instruments across sites so that, you know, the instrument configurations at least are all the same and they pass, you know, CSNT 
the same um, across sites or within a lab. Um, however, even if you standardize the instrument, you know, this doesn't capture or doesn't eliminate the batch effects that are going to be caused by sample preparation or site to site variability. So, um, you know, when we try to address the uh, sample processing steps, everybody uh, uh, is going to have standard operating procedures, right? We all have protocols for how we're supposed to stain things. You have to stain it, you know, X amount of antibody, uh, you know, this dilution for this amount of time uh, in the absence of light, et cetera. And then, um, you know, you will run the sample, let's say on the machine at a particular speed, which is great. Uh, but again, you know, even the SOPs are not going to account for the difference, the slight differences in different people's hands. So, you know, let's say Judy on, at site number one, you know, and Sam at site number two, you know, they have maybe they went a little long on the wash or a little short on the stain time, you know, um, that's going to give rise to uh, those differences and you can't easily control uh, for that. Obviously, robots might help in that instance, but again, may not always be av available. Uh, another solution to sort of minimizing the batch effects is to put samples, you know, uh, try to run the samples in a single batch, right? Try to put everything on one run together. And uh, the only problem with this is that you may not have all the samples available at the same time. And this is pretty typical for clinical uh, work, you know, you get a sample that comes in in the morning, you have another one that comes in the next day, obviously you can't run uh, the samples on the same day, you can't put them into the same batch, so you want to run them, uh, you know, and you may want to run them as fast as possible so that the marker expression doesn't slide, let's say, over time. Um, another solution uh, to the sample processing problem is multiplexing, right, barcoding, try to put everything into a single tube. Um, of course, there's a limit as to how many barcodes you can put, especially when we're talking about flow cytometry into a given, uh, into a given tube for any, uh, you know, any experiment. So there are limits on all of these solutions. And, um, you know, we can only do so much to minimize those effects. Now, the uh, cytonorm is not the first attempt at uh, trying to computationally, you know, address these batch effects. Uh, there's a, an algorithm called Gauss norm and another one called FDA norm that sort of preceded uh, cytonorm. And I think, you know, each paper was pretty good. The, the, I think the approach is definitely solid. And um, I, I, you know, appreciate the, the effort as all of us do because this is a serious problem, um, you know, that faces us, especially in, in flow cytometry. So the Gauss norm um, methodology, what it uh, attempt, attempted to do was essentially um, um, identify so-called landmarks in every channel, or, you know, you can think of this as a marker expression for um, any, you know, given population that is present in the data set. So you can think of a landmark as a population, negative, positive, maybe mid expressing, and then of course the channel is going to be the individual marker. Um, so it works by identifying these landmarks and then matching the corresponding landmarks across samples. So you have a sample, you see that, oh, let's say it's got two or three landmarks in a given channel. And you say, okay, well, for channel X, we should have three landmarks. You go to the next sample, look at channel X again, and apply those, uh, those three landmarks. And then you do a data transformation step so that everything kind of uh, looks the same. And that's kind of indicated by this uh, panel on the right-hand side, right? So you have a series of samples here uh, indicated in the different rows. And then the different colors are the so-called channels, the different channels and the landmarks are the populations within those channels. So for example, in sample number one, the blue channel, you have two populations uh, that are identified. This is the classification step where the landmarks are actually identified. And then, you know, you try to align or transform all of your samples to that particular, uh, to that particular channel. Now, the problem with this method was that it was a global alignment and didn't consider uh, cell type specific 
effects, right? And we can talk a little bit more about this in, in a little more detail in a later slide. But um, in general, you know, you don't have, it didn't account for differences in expression between say, I don't know, T cells and B cells or NK cells and monocytes, et cetera. And then uh, there's another algorithm, algorithm that um, we're calling here local alignment. And um, this is just an extension to FDA norm. And this was kind of a nice attempt at uh, normalizing data. It actually used uh, a manually gated um, a template sample as sort of the reference sample that identified these landmarks. So rather than looking at Gaussian distributions and determining you know, whether a landmark existed based on a particular density, it actually used uh, manually gated populations to identify the landmarks and then applied that, um, those uh, landmarks to the, you know, to the whole subset. Um, the problem with this method though, is that it only was applying you know, that particular uh, uh, manually gated template across uh, a given batch and it didn't go across multiple batches, which is essentially where we want to, you know, this is gonna be on the much larger longitudinal studies, what we want to um, uh, decrease. And so it kind of lacked in that regard, um, what, uh, what hopefully cytonorm uh, will answer. So I kind of preempted the next slide, but cytonorm is supposed to, is kind of the answer to uh, the problems with both of those previous uh, methods that it, in that it will address those batch effects in a cell type specific way and across multiple batches, right? So there's a little bit lacking, as I mentioned in the previous methods, and this is supposed to answer those too. So what I have here is just a figure from the uh, Sophie Van Gassen's paper, and it kind of shows an eagle eye view of what the uh, workflow looks like or what the algorithm is actually doing. So what you will have in a given data set when you set up your, uh, when you set up your runs, every batch is going to have a uh, control sample. And then what is listed here as a validation sample, these are just your test samples or other samples that are included in the batch. Okay, and you can see that each plate here is being treated as a different batch. So this information is, in, uh, is input into the algorithm. And in the first step, what ends up happening, instead of using a manually gated template, kind of like FDA norm was doing, uh, flow sum clustering is done to map out all the cell types that are present in those control samples. And then once all of the clusters have been identified, there is a function here where for every cluster, again, for every specific cell type and for every marker, the algorithm computes these quantiles for each replicate of the, uh, of the control sample. So you'll get a distribution for each marker right, across each, uh, each cell type or each cluster that the algorithm finds. And then once you uh, have identified all these or have applied these quantiles, you essentially, the algorithm essentially finds the mean or a goal distribution that represents uh, what the data look like in those reference um, controls. And then you take this goal distribution or what the ideal distribution should look like. And then you apply something called a spline function uh, to the test samples. So this is just a way of extrapolating the distribution that you have here in the goal. Um, it's, it's a way to mimic that pattern that you, that you have in a nonlinear distribution. So obviously flow cytometry data is nonlinear, or at least when we display it, right? It's over several decades, log transform data and uh, the spleen function essentially maps that nonlinear uh, data back onto this gold um, distribution. So once you have that uh, spline function applied, then uh, cytonorm takes this information and then applies it to your test samples. So everything that's in red here essentially represents your test samples. It comes back, goes ahead and takes that initial flow sum map, applies it to your test samples. And then again, for every metacluster that's uh, present there, it's going to inherit uh, 
the, um, the goal distribution for every uh, cell type and every marker. And then of course, what you end up with is um, aligned data um, in the end. So that's the goal. Uh, this slide, I'm just kind of talking about the, the, the reason why you would want to cluster uh, the data, um, you know, versus, you know, versus not identifying the, the different types of cells. And the reason is kind of displayed here in the figure on the right hand side. So here we're looking at two different cell types. You've got B cells on the left and monocytes on the right. And we're looking at DR expression um, in those different uh, uh, cell types. You can see that in B cells, the expression of DR is pretty uh, consistent. There's a little bit of wobble here in the last two plates, but in general, it's pretty consistent across uh, those samples, whereas DR expression in monocytes is more highly varied, and it's, it's particularly different um, in the latter two uh, plates that were acquired here. And so the argument is, you know, you want to identify batch effects that may occur in a cell type specific manner and correct for those. So in other words, you know, if you just looked at DR expression across all cells, you might miss the variability that is occurring, the technical variability here that's occurring in um, monocytes, whereas it, it's not really occurring in B cells. And so you want to cluster there so that you can account for the variability that's occurring in, in, uh, in a cell type specific uh, manner. Okay, and so we go into a little detail here, but generally you're just going to do flow sum clustering. That's what cytonorm does, and then um, the reason they use uh, flow sum is because it's a you know it's a pretty fast algorithm, and of course the author of cytonorm and flow sum is the is the same, so it kind of makes sense if you got a good tool, reuse it. Um, there's some QA that's also kind of done while the algorithm is. Uh, you know, calculating all of the um, all of the functions so that essentially measures the CVs of each of the clusters. So it kind of does a series of clustering steps under the covers, so to speak. So we have when the algorithm runs, it'll do a uh, a run where you get five clusters, ten clusters, fifteen, or the default here um, uh, uh, twenty five. And what it attempts to do here is it maps out the um, the CV value for each of the clustering set of clustering results. And it, they, they mentioned in the paper that if you get a CV value of greater than two, <clears throat> that the clustering itself is impacted by uh, batch effects. And so you, you know, possible potential solution to this is to reduce the cluster numbers or just skip, skip clustering altogether. Now in Flojo, we cannot skip the, the clustering step as it's embedded into the plugin. So it just, it, it's gonna go ahead and cluster anyway, but what you can do is you can modify the numbers of clusters. Okay, and then the other bit of information that it spits out um, is it kind of tells you which uh, batches are essentially driving um, the clusters that you see in the, in the end. So the figure on the right here kind of shows the cl different cluster numbers as, a, uh, as, as the columns, and then the batches are shown um, as rows. And then what you're looking at here is the percentage of cells that are assigned to each cluster. <clears throat> so you can see here that in this first row, cluster number one is primarily being driven by batch number two, where it has 17% you know, of the cells um, 17% of the cells in that first cluster, whereas uh, batch number one and batch number one, uh, batch number one and batch number three are at one and four uh, percent respectively. So ideally, again, you want to see a more even distribution of uh, uh, cells across each batch. You don't want to have a particular batch driving um, a lot of the cluster formation. So you you would, you know, if you see a result like this, you might go back and modify the number of clusters that you impute into the algorithm to sort of um, uh, reduce this or at least make it more even. Uh, this is a little bit more detail on the, uh, on the quantiles. So you can think of a quantile as just a line that, you know, a particular uh, 
an arbitrary number of cells falls below. So as an example, a quantile could be the 50% line where essentially 50% of the data lie below it, 50% uh, lie above it. And that would be also the same as the median. 100% uh, quantile, you know, of course, all the data are below it. So in any case, what the algorithm does or what Cytonorm does here is it actually computes 100 different quantiles to, uh, you know, figure out the goal distribution in the end. And it essentially takes the mean of this uh, to get your goal distribution. And then uh, again, that spline function is applied and you get the data um, out in the end. Um, an example here of um, just to kind of, you know, recapitulate this, this mapping back of the goal distribution onto your data. If uh, the authors here have a, you know, are looking at CD15 expression where, you know, the negative population here is pretty stable across samples, but the positive population has quite a, uh, a decent amount of wobble. And so, you know, again, we're trying to take a, uh, a goal distribution and, and map that distribution back to a nonlinear uh, data set, right? We have data that are across multiple decades. And um, this is effectively what happens after that spline function is applied, right? This is the original data. You see a little bit of wobble in that positive population. After you normalize the data, you have uh, fairly, you know, fairly consistent peaks. They're a bit tighter. And then, you know, obviously this should lead to, uh, you know, if you're doing high dimensional work, when you get your Tisney plot, you should see fewer clusters um, as a result of, you know, the, the reduction in the batch effects. If you see a lot of these sort of <laughs> little islands all over the place, and they segregate based on sample, then you know you have a ton of batch effects present in the data set. Okay. Um, if one thing to really consider here too is that you need to have a control sample uh, uh, across each batch and you need to have, uh, for every stimulation condition that you have present, you have to have essentially a control for that. So for example, if you have a non-stim sample, you need to obviously have that uh, assigned as a control, but you also need to have a control sample that has, uh, let's say that has been stimulated. So whatever your experimental variables happen to be in that data set, right? I stim with IL-1, I stim with TNF, I stim with LPS. Each of those conditions has to be assigned as a, a essentially as a reference control. So you're in, in total in that instance, you would have four different controls. You have your unstim, you have what your interferon stim looks like, you have what your LPS stim looks like, and you have what your IL-1 uh, stim looks like. And you have to assign those uh, across each batch. Uh, if you don't do that, that's essentially what this figure on the right is attempting to, uh, to warn you about. The uh, picture on the far right over here shows the concordance of the data uh, with each other if you only train the data on an unstimulated sample and you don't do you don't have any training on a on a on a stimulated sample you can see that there's not a lot of concordance between the normalized data and the raw data or the the you know the uh, the default data the non-normalized um, whereas if you do train on an unstim and you also train on a uh, uh, on an interferon stimulated sample there is much greater concordance between the normalized data, which is in red, and the non-normalized data here, and that is in black. So again, it's not perfect, but it does a better job, obviously. Um, and it's, you know, again, it's another attempt at addressing this question. Okay, and so there's a little bit of difference uh, implementation and how Flojo has it. So Flojo, I'm kind of indicating here by the, the little icon um, for our Cytonorm plugin. Um, but the, the primary difference is that in R, you can skip the, the clustering step, whereas in Flojo, it's going to go ahead and cluster regardless. You don't have that uh, opportunity to, to tell it to skip clustering. And then the evaluation of the CV um, is done sort of in the second step in R, whereas at R, 
in our implementation, it's actually at the, um, at the end. So there's slightly different implementation, uh, but in the end, you get, uh, I would say a result that's, that's uh, it's the same result. It's just how the steps are kind of organized is different. And then how do we set this up? How do you get Cytonorm, et cetera? These are available on the Exchange, Flojo Exchange website. I'll show you how to do that here momentarily. Um, it is an R dependent uh, uh, plugin, but we have just recently released the plug and play bundle. So, you know, you don't have to worry about <clears throat> installing R and all of that kind of stuff that the R scripts, just download the plug and play bundle. It's included with it and it will go ahead and set up all that stuff in the background for you without you having to, to do anything. Um, it is different in terms of how it works. If, you've got, if you have ever used any of our other so-called population plugins, um, the workspace plugin works a little bit differently. And so I'll show you um, how to, you know, I'll show you kind of the difference there and how you would implement this. And then uh, an important thing here is to make sure that you keep your files local. It's a very uh, computationally intense um, uh, series of steps. And so uh, you want to make sure that your, your data files are located on your hard drive and not you know, on a cloud drive or a network map drive. You don't want uh, Flojo having to calculate you know, over wireless, for example, to, to get your, uh, your data out. Okay, and so I think that's it for the slideshow. Let's go ahead and, and do a little demo to show you kind of the, the outputs here. I'm gonna check the Q&A, uh, check the Q&A box here. There's, an, a, there's a question, and what, what could cause the cell specific variability? How do you know you are not erasing biological variability? Uh, that's great, yeah, that's a great question. The cell specific variability, right? It, it can be like in the case of those B cells and the monocytes, monocytes express MHC class two um, at you know different, more variable or different levels, let's say, than B cells do. And whether or not that is um, functionally significant, I think you know remains to be seen. Uh, but things that can impact that variability are like you know how much time you put the you have the cells on ice or how they're how long they're left at room temperature. There can be other things like, I don't know, drug treatment that can uh, impact the expression of, you know, MHC class two on, on those monocytes. So I'm just, you know, I'm, you know, coming up with stuff um, just, just on the fly here, but you could have a situation where let's say, you know, LPS significantly impacts uh, the expression of MHC class two on monocytes, but not so much on B cells, right? The, the MHC class two is going to be fairly steady there. So the the cytonorm package attempts to address this by identifying those monocytes in, um, you know, in the data set and also identifying the B cells and understanding, okay, well, the B cells, they're pretty stable in their expression with MHC class two, whereas the monocytes are more highly, uh, more highly variable. Okay, so there's a question here. How can we include the control sample to long-term experiments? Should we freeze and thaw samples from day zero and stain them alongside the current batch? So any, you know, it's hard for me to say exactly what you should do in that case, but anytime you can kind of put any this, all the samples into the same run, right? You wanna minimize as many possible variables as you have going at any one time. So if you can, you know, if you can process all the stuff in a particular batch, get that done in one run, it's probably, you know, better in terms of, you know, reducing the numbers of batch effects um, than processing them uh, at different times. But again, that may not be practical, right? So what you want to do is you want to map out your, all of your steps, essentially, or all the, you know, the primary steps that will lead to uh, batch effects and figure out which ones you can amalgamate or kind of com combine into one so that you minimize another opportunity for batch effects to arise in that process. So if that means that, you know, you go ahead and you store your samples for a year and then, you know, process them at the end of the year, 
uh, because you don't want to, you know, you don't want to have that that uh, month to month variability. You know, you can do it that way. It may not be practical though to to actually do that. Okay, so another question here is: Can you normalize samples that have different panels? Um, no. If if it's a different panel, you have a different marker. Uh, you know, different marker subset. You cannot normalize between those. Um, yeah, different colors of antibodies. I mean, you could try to do that, but I don't think the answer is, I don't think what you're doing there, you're not doing a true normalization because you're, you know, you're taking something that's wild, wildly different in terms of its expression or its brightness and attempting to map it back to something that has a completely different, um, completely different distribution. So I would not advise uh, I would not advise trying to normalize between different panels. Okay, so I'm going to say that those questions have been answered live. Let's quickly jump into Flojo. So we open up Flojo, and <clears throat> let me quickly show you where you can obtain the uh, plugin if you don't have it already. So you would go to your uh, plugins dropdown, which is located underneath the workspace tab here. You go to plugins and you'll see this first option that says Flojo Exchange. If you click on this, it's going to take you. Oh, well, <laughs> thank you, BD. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> doesn't like it. So let's just go to exchange.flojo.com. So this is essentially where that link will take you, but <laughs> BD's, that's so funny. BD security software doesn't like links coming from its own software. Oh, that's fantastic. Anyway, here we go. So uh, this is essentially where that link is going to take you. We have all of our uh, plugins here for the different uh, two different programs that we have, SeekGeek being the uh, single cell sequencing. You could probably just turn that one off um, and then that will just get rid of the plugins that are specific for SeekGeek. Um, but you come here and we would be looking for um, cytonorm. So again, there's this version, which is sort of a standalone version and you'll have to you know, set up all the R and stuff, or you can use uh, this guy, which is the plug and play bundle, which was just recently released here on February 8th. So you would just download this, it includes cytonorm, uh, flow clean, flow sum, index sort, and file inbox. So there's a uh, a number of plugins in here included, not just Cytonorm, they're really useful. And again, if you download this bundle, you don't have to do any of the R installation and that kind of stuff. So I kind of recommend this um, to people, you know, right off the bat, if you want to use Cytonorm in particular, very easy to set up. You don't have to do, you know, you don't have to really hassle with R and stuff. So all of this stuff is freely available. You just click the little downward arrow, and then there's a how-to list of instructions inside the, um, the zip package, okay? So now, in the case of Cytonorm, the way it runs or the way it works in Flojo is pretty simple. Click plugins once you have installed your plugin you know, bundle, and then what you're gonna do is instead of finding it in the list here, you click on this button that says add workspace plugin. So the functionality here is quite different than the other plugins that you may be used to. Then you'll get this little prompt. It asks you for the uh, workspace plugin you wanna add. In my case, I wanna do Cytonorm. So I click okay. And then what will happen is it opens up a prompt asking me for the data set that I wish to, um, that I want to normalize, right? So. I have a couple of data sets here, and maybe I'll actually choose a smaller data set just so that you can you can see what happens a little bit quicker. I have the, the full data set takes like five or six minutes to process. So I'll take one that's a little bit, um, you know, just a little bit easier, faster to to witness the uh, the outputs for. And what you do is you just go ahead and select those FCS files that you want to have normalized. You click open, and then this will go ahead and load those data files into this interface. Now you can arrange the batch by date. So if you have you know, samples that are coming in uh, different time points, this is a super useful uh, button. In my case, all of these files were acquired on the same day. Um, but uh, 
so we're not going to arrange it essentially by that that methodology but you would go ahead and select your controls so again you want to make sure that you mark the um, the controls for each type of stimulation so even though it's not obvious in my title here but my non-stimulated is kind of indicated by this ns ns then i have an nspi step this is going to be my like my 20 minute stim um, then I have like a one hour stim and then a two hour stim. So I have to have controls for each of those conditions to make sure that the algorithm normalizes appropriately for each sample type. Okay, so then you assign the batches. So I'm going to say, okay, well, these all come from, you know, the uh, like say four different batches. And then you just align the remaining um, samples here, right? Oops. Uh, to their respective batches. So in my case here, I'm aligning each stim condition, right, to its batch. And then, whoops. You have to click the tab button twice in order to get it to move. And sometimes, you know, my brain gets confused and I don't type the right numbers. So I'm just gonna click, okay. So you input the batch numbers, and then you have the option down here to uh, normalize the controls as well. So if you want to get it the mean, you know, essentially the mean goal distribution for everything, you can um, take that and apply it to your control samples. So you would tick this box. So I would say, why not? All right? We go ahead and normalize everything together. It should, in theory, put everything uh, close. If you don't tick this, which is the default, then that means that all of these remaining samples are going to essentially be um, aligned or normalized to these reference um, to these reference controls. So it's up to you whether you want to include them or not. I'm going to show you the full you know the full output here where we normalize everything, and then the number of clusters that you can feed into the algorithm here it ranges from one to twenty. Uh, the default setting here is ten. And again, according to the QA uh, outputs that you saw earlier, you can kind of determine whether you need more or less clusters. So then you click OK, then you should see this little window appear. And this will take a second or two to, um, well, a second or two, it'll probably take a couple of minutes to, um, to generate the output. And when it does, it'll actually open up a new workspace for you. So in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and answer um, some questions we have in the chat box here. And then um, hopefully by the time I'm done with that, the normalization will be done and I'll show you, um, I could show you some other data that I've actually aligned and, and done uh, previous. Same data set, just, you know, I've done a little bit more work on it. Okay, so, um, First question here is, I assume you use compensated data for normalization. If so, can you normalize sample sets with different compensation matrices if a, standard, if a standardized instrumentation is used? Yes, you can. So long as the compensation, you know, again, the compensation matrix is reflecting the same panel, then the, then the answer is yes, I'm using compensated um, data files uh, in this case. And, each of those data files essentially would inherit, the normalized data files would inherit the compensation matrix respective for, um, uh, for that particular uh, time point. Is there an automated way to assign batch numbers? Is this gonna be very, yeah, it is very tedious. I agree with you. Um, I agree with you, Anya, it is very tedious and that is an improvement that I wish um, uh, we could get on. And there is, we're doing some work on that to, to improve it. So you would have like a keyword in the workspace that uh, identifies, the, um, identifies the batch number and then you know, brings that information in automatically for you rather than you having to write in the value every time. Um, alternatively, we've thought about using this uh, create keyword value series function within the plugin itself. So it hasn't been formalized um, yet, but those are just some ideas that we're working on to make it 
um, a little bit easier because yeah, right now this is, I would say it's kind of impract impractical if you have, you know, hundreds of samples, it's used for full smaller batches, but if you have to sit there and type in the number across multiple, it's a little bit tough. Okay, so I had hoped that this was gonna be done. I didn't time it, you know, um, previous other than, other than to say that the, um, you know, full data set took about five to six minutes. So this is taking a little bit longer than I had wanted to. Um, another question here is, do we have to differentiate stimulated from unstimulated controls? Yes, you do. So you need to tell the algorithm, hey, you know, this is, this is, uh, 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 control number one, control number two, control number three. So when you tick that tick, when you're ticking the boxes, you're effectively telling it that you have a different, um, you know, a different sample type uh, in that interface. Okay, so then you get the normalized data out here, and you know you can apply gates from other workspaces if you want to uh, the normalized data. Um, I will tell you guys that. You know, I've been working with this in particular because I have a talk, talk coming up in June where I want to use this across um, some patient data for COVID-19 stuff. And, um, you know, I'm, 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 <laughs> I am wrangling with a lot of uh, different aspects of the, um, you know, of the, of the algorithm. And I'll just show you kind of like what what I've found so far. So you can take it with a grain of salt. It might be a data specific thing, um, but I have this um, workspace here where I've done some um, comparisons looking at my two hour stims and you know, whether, you know, when I've, I've normalized the data across, um, you know, the different samples. So you can kind of see what it's gonna uh, look like. Um, Zeomar, the samples that I um, normalized, were they already gated? In, th in that case, yes, they were. I had exported cleaned up populations. Um, now I'll show you some data here though, that kind of, you know, I was wondering whether or not the data should be cleaned up first and then normalized, or should you just use, uh, you know, kind of the raw data? And um, let's see if I can't get this, all of these plots onto, you know, let's try to get this all onto a single layout here so you guys can see everything. I think that last one on the right, yeah, it is. So I might cut off a sample because of the title here. Let me just move the titles a little bit over so you know, that we can see these things all together. So I apologize for the cramped space, but here we go. So <clears throat> I did an initial test where um, I was looking at, you know, data that had been cleaned up. So again, I got rid of doublets, I got rid of debris, dead cells, right? I'm only working with the live population. I exported that and then I normalized. And then I also did the data here where we didn't um, do any kind of a cleanup. And so what I'm looking at here is uh, each of the samples is kind of indicated by um, the individual columns, okay? And then the y-axis here is a marker, uh, expression of a given uh, marker that we have in the, in the data set, okay? So um, in the case here where everything is not normalized, you're just looking at, you know, essentially the raw data and then it, but it has been cleaned up. So there's no dead cells, there's no debris, there's no doublets, right? And actually, when I looked at this, I think that the data look actually pretty good. Uh, I was kind of hoping that uh, for MHC class two here that uh, we would, you know, we would get a little bit more even, um, even distribution in that positive, uh, in that positive space, and maybe the same thing here for uh, phospho, erc, and perforin. So you can kind of see there's a little bit of, you know, up down um, distribution in those in those uh, pockets. Now, when I clean the data um, and then normalized it, so it's essentially following the same thing. It's just non-normalized versus normalized in the first two lines here. 
you know, when we look at MHC class two, you can see that I've got this little, I don't know, this little bubble down here. It did well for the first four samples, but that fifth sample for whatever reason is a little bit, I don't know, it just looks weird. And then that seems to hold true across um, the other panels. I didn't draw a line here to give you the, um, you know, to, to, to help you visualize this because it's, <laughs> it's really kind of difficult, but um, the statistics here, the, the medians are closer together across these first, well, actually all five samples when I um, <clears throat> uh, have a gate present, the medians here are, are more consistent than they are across the non-normalized data um, uh, for, for perforin and then for phospho the same, um, uh, the same is true for the first four, except this, this fifth sample. Again, it's a little bit, you know, I don't know what happened, but it got mapped to the wrong, you know, the wrong, uh, goal distribution. And, uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, the, as far as I'm concerned, for me and this talk that I have to do, I, you know, I have to, I really have to work with this algorithm a little bit more to kind of determine what's going on. And you can kind of see here in some of the other um, markers, right? Interferon, we've got this, you know, expansion of the negative, uh, kind of the negative distribution um, in the uh, in the normalized data, but it's not present uh, in the in the non-normalized data. So I, you know, got got some questions, uh, I've got some questions there. Now in the third row here, what happened is I just, I didn't do any cleanup and I normalized the data. So you're just taking like raw data files. Uh, they've been compensated, but we do the normalization. And in this case, um, <laughs> funny thing, the DR sample here looks a little bit better than if I had cleaned it up. So I'm, you know, as I said, like this is an this is a mystery to me. I'm not exactly sure what is um, going on, and I don't quite understand exactly what's going on with the um, the kind of the spread and the negative distribution. However, I will say that um, when we use clustering algorithms, the clustering algorithms are particularly sensitive to um, negative values um, in the, you know, in the data set. So the transforms that have these negative values kind of throws it for a loop. And I assume that that is what's going on here. And that's why there's sort of this spread going on in, uh, in the negative. But I haven't, you know, I haven't um, settled 100% on that. So there's, there are some caveats to the use of, of, of this. And again, it worked pretty well for the first four, but the, the fifth one is kind of a problem. And now another test that I did here was just to look at um, the numbers of, of, of clusters. So I increased and I reduced the numbers of clusters and I kind of compared them there. If you wanna see the PNGs for all of these, these are the outputs. So in this case, um, uh, in this run here, I had uh, you know, told the algorithm to give me 20 clusters total. You can kind of see that I have a couple clusters here that are approaching that that you know critical value of two, indicating that maybe you know the the CV is getting a little too high, and so we're starting to experience um, you know variability amongst those amongst those clusters. Um, that was in the run where I did you know I had twenty, and then we did another one here where I had uh, this is uh, looking at uh, telling the algorithm to do five clusters, you can see that everything, you know, <laughs> pretty, pretty nice and blue. And in this case, I did a, a run where we had uh, 10 clusters. So the 10 and the five, you know, they should fit. They don't have a ton of, you know, ton of variability. If I'm reading the paper correctly and kind of, you know, following what they kind of indicate there. But when I plot this out, again, I've got you know, clean data, all of these are, have been cleaned up. We have a non-normalized uh, data set looking at the same markers. Um, and then we have five clusters, 20 clusters, or 10 clusters. Um, indeed, when I go down to five clusters, I seem to get rid of that negative um, distribution here. So that, that actually helped. Um, but I do see a little bit of, you know, a little bit of dust here in my CD4 uh, uh, CD4 distributions. 
right? And then um, my uh, HLADR, the MHC class two is actually, you know, has actually gotten better. Um, but the interesting thing here to me is, that, again, it's kind of a mystery, right? If I go down to five, it cleans up that that uh, that fifth sample for MHC class two, if I go up to 20 clusters, it's fine. But if I use 10 clusters, I get this, you know, this wobble. So what I want to tell you guys is just, you know, use this with caution. You have to test it out on your on your data um, and you have to do these kinds of comparisons and look at, you know, kind of look at what's going on across um, across all your marker sets, because it may work. <laughs> In my case, it may work for the first four, but that fifth sample is a problem. So maybe, you know, maybe I need to um, segregate the normalization runs, you know, and just take these first four, and then maybe this guy is such an anomaly that I have to put him in with a batch that um, has more anomalous patients. So uh, that I'm still, you know, I would say the jury is out as, as to what has to happen there, but it's not as, Mm, straightforward or as easy, you know, as, uh, as I would like it to be. So just, just, you know, be aware. Yeah. So uh, Zeomar, the, the, what can help you choose the number of clusters theoretically this, this output should help you because it actually does a five, 10, 15 and 25, uh, clustering. And the idea is, okay, if you have, you know, low CV, you know, low CVs in each um, clustering run, the ones that have lower CVs should, should give you a better um, output. But I kind of, I don't know, in my hands here, that didn't really, you know, aside from the five cluster, um, the five cluster run, the, the 20 cluster run actually was better than my 10. And by looking at you know, this PNG would say, oh, well, you know, don't, don't go into the 20 range because you're going to get a lot of, you know, you're, you're going to start to get clusters that have a relatively, uh, a relatively high CV. Now, to me, what makes sense is you want to have more clusters. You want to overfit the model because you want to, again, you want to identify all the possible types of, of cells that you have in the data set. If you reduce the number of clusters down to five, you're essentially jamming everything into, you know, five different phenotypes. So <laughs> I think what you're, what, what's happening here when you're reducing the number of clusters is you're actually just, you know, you're just, you're just blinding the biological differences for, for, uh, of, of cell type to cell type. And you're just, you're kind of going back to that global uh, normalization. Now it makes everything look nice, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, what you get out in the end is, is correct. So I'm kind of at a, you know what I mean? I'm kind of at a crossroads here where I need to really, you know, hammer this out on, on this particular data set um, to figure out what's going on. Now, other data sets, like the one they used in the paper, they were using a mass cytometry data set. And the reason I think it worked really well in the mass cytometry data set is because the dynamic range of mass cytometry data is, um, is smaller than it is in flow. Um, and so if you have a you know, lower dynamic range, it's probably easier to map those spline functions onto the data than it is when you, you know, you're trying to go over four or five decades as you are in, in, in flow. So those, these are just hypotheses of mine. I don't know for sure, but I'm just showing you this is what the data look like on true flow cy cytometric data, you know, and the compensation is good on these data sets. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Uh, some other questions here. How, where do you change cluster number in cytonorms? So you change the cluster number in the um, uh, initial interface here. So let me open up a new workspace. So you go to workspace, plugins, add workspace plugin. You tell it what you want, right? Cytonorm, click OK. Let's pick some. This is kind of a little annoying. Uh, you know, prompts because I don't like the way it searches for your files here. So what I do, and this is, I was taught just yesterday how to do this. You just take the folder that contains the data that you want from your finder or your explorer, depending on whether you're on Mac or Windows, and just dump it into that interface and it'll immediately go to the folder that you want to look at. You pick the files and then it's here in this interface, 
that you can tell it how many clusters you want. So you can go up or down. And again, the upper limit here is gonna be around 20 clusters. Okay. So let's go back to the questions in the chat box. So I hope that answers your question, Anya. Um, do you have a written protocol you can send me for using CIDRNORM? So technically, yes, we do. Um, when you download the plugin from the Exchange website, so let me just go to CIDRNORM here, and we'll go ahead and download this. What ends up happening is you get a zipped file, and then when you open up or expand that zip file, you will, uh, it will include a, um, it's going to include a how-to. So let's do uh, cytonorm, should be a folder that just got, uh, unzipped. So you have, this is what it's essentially going to be. You have a high, how to, and then what it is, how you use it, right? You have sort of the protocol here, selecting your reference controls, assigning the batches and all that kind of stuff. So all of that information um, is included in that download. Okay. Another question here is, are the samples you show here the samples you use for normalization standards or the samples that were normalized? So I'm showing in that in this workspace, I'm showing you the raw data and the normalized data. Okay, so what we have here, uh, let's see, go back to Flojo, go back here, and I'm coming here. So everything that we have here, the, the first row is just the cleaned up data without any normalization done whatsoever. They're the exact same, the, the, all of the samples here are matched, right? This is patient one all the way down, patient two, patient three, four, and five. And then the difference is uh, the normalization, right? So in this case, we've, we've all normalized, but um, we've either done five, 20, or 10 uh, clusters. And every time I ran it, I normalized everything um, together. So the comparisons essentially are graph to graph, not so much within a particular uh, within a particular graph. Although you can obviously see that in some of these normalizations, the um, uh, the first four samples seem to look either pretty good or, in this case, pretty bad with respect to that negative uh, distribution. Um, and the, the one sample on the right seems to be, you know, seems to be different. Uh, let's see here. Can you previously predict your number of clusters by using another plugin like Phenograph? Um, so Gael, I would say in that case, no, because how, Phenograph and flow some cluster each you know cluster the data it tends to be I find it to be quite different. Um, my personal feeling is again this is not a claim that Flojo or BD is making it's just my personal experience with Phenograph and Flowsum. I find that Phenograph does a much better job of identifying you know populations that you would manually gate in a data set. Now when I say much better job it's really it's marginal but it's noticeable. And so, you know, I would, I would not necessarily take what, what Phenograph says and then use that as a proxy. I guess it's okay, um, but just don't try to think that, okay, cluster, you, you, you know, if you feed 15 clusters into Phenograph that you're gonna get the exact same number of populations or, or matching populations, I should say, in Flowsum. So maybe I'm, you know, maybe I misunderstanding the question there. I, I suppose you can use it as a proxy for how many clusters you should you should have in Flowsum, um, but just don't assume that the clusters are the same. Does that make sense? <laughs> Convoluted way to answer that question, but that, that's what I meant. Um, how can I know the number of clusters? First, I need to apply another algorithm as Fiend Graph. No, you 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 don't. 
There's no easy way to know the number of clusters, but the nice thing in a sense is that you're limited in, in cytonorm here to a total of 20 clusters. So, you know, you can go from one to 20. Um, you know, if, if you look at your, if you have a manually gated um, data set, right, of that same type of data, you can kind of count up the number of populations that you have present there and use that as a proxy for how many clusters you should have um, in, your, in your cytonorm. Do you have a record to watch later? Yes, oh yeah, sorry. So I'll show you where the where this stuff is gonna be. So this is a recorded session and what's gonna happen is um, it's gonna be posted to, the, uh, to our website. So what's gonna happen is once it gets compiled, you would go to the learn tab here, you'll see this webinars um, link. So let me close the chat box real quick. You go to the learn tab and you will go to webinars, right? And you'll see this is where today's webinar is occurring obviously, but down at the bottom, you see explore previously recorded webinars and you'll see recorded webinars button here. You click on this and it will have a list of all of them that we've done in the past. Mine is obviously gonna float to the top here, um, but when you click on this, It'll open up a link that takes you, um, you know, to the to the previous recording, right? So you can watch this uh, later if you so decide. Okay, so that's where it's going to be uh, held. If you guys need that link, or you know, you forget, or whatever, you can always ping me. My email is jack.flojo at bd.com. So jack.flojo at bd.com. Um, I think there was another question here. What tells you that your normalized data are actually better, cleaner, more correct than unnormalized data? Also, how do you control uh, the standard you use? So what tells you that your normalized data are actually better, cleaner? So that's a difficult question to, to answer just up front, but let's assume again that you have, you know, if you've got data that have some wobble and you expect that that, you know, that wobble is only due to technical effects, right? To batch effects that I ran this sample. Let's say you had the exact same sample. You split it into two and you ran it on two different machines. And then you put, you know, you acquired that data you're looking at it and you can see that marker expression on cytometer number one is different than that same marker expression for the same samples, um, same comp matrix, right? On uh, instrument number two. In, that's, in that instance, you can say that the raw data, right? They should be exactly the same because it's the exact same sample, exact same comp matrix. It's just that you know you ran it on you ran it on uh, one instrument versus the other, and assume that both instruments have the same instrument configuration, right? So why is there a difference in the marker expression in one versus the other? Well, the answer is because of batch effects. These little nuances that exist in sample preparation, or in this case nuance differences between those two instruments. So I can't say, uh, you know, across all conditions that normalization is necessarily better. But again, what we're attempting to do here is we're trying to minimize the, uh, the effects due to these sort of, you know, these artifacts that occur across sites, across time points. Um, and so, you know, hopefully the normalization makes the, um, you know, makes the output better, but we don't, <laughs> you'll, I guess you'll have to investigate that yourself um, to understand. So another pitfall that you bring up here, Anya, is that if you have a, an allele that has sort of polymorphic expression of a given marker, right? And you may see this obviously in the, in the population at large, you might have a population you might have a marker that has, let's say, low, mid, high. Maybe one person expresses sort of all three of those alleles. You have another person in the population that expresses only two of those alleles. And then a third person that, let's say, only expresses one 
normalization of the data in that case, right, for that given marker is probably not a good idea because you're going to, in theory, you're going to jam everything into one, one distribution when in reality there are three. So the way you would normalize that appropriately is you would bin the patients or the people that have that, um, that uh, three allele expression together. You would say, okay, well, these guys all express marker X to low, mid, and high degrees. And we put all those characters into a bin and we normalize those guys together. Then you take the people that have, you know, the two distributions for that given allele and you put that into a second group and you normalize them together. So you would just effectively treat them as separate reference controls, right? So I hope that, I hope that makes sense. Um, how can you control the standard you use? Yeah, so again, I suppose breaking down the standard, it's difficult when you're talking about patient data because you can have all these polymorphic alleles, but you'll, you would have to bin, you just have to bin the, the, the people into these different groups and say, okay, well, if this guy is polymorphic, um, he's, he's, gonna be a, he's gonna have to have a control for his type of expression pattern, right? And if she has her, you know, she has a different polymorphic allele. We're going to have to bin her and, and, and the people that express like her into her, uh, into, in, into her own group. And they're going to have to have their own reference control there. So hopefully that, that helps. Uh, you're all welcome. Uh, there's a question here. So if your experiment is comparing two mouse strains, wild type versus KO infected with a virus, do you need a wild type and KO control for every batch? So I would, Jose, I would definitely do that because who knows how the how wildly, let's say, the knockout is going to uh, is going to react. Now, if you find that you know looking at the wild type and knockouts, um, you know there's no allelic expressions that are different. Um, it's such that you you don't have to bin you know wild type and knockouts differently. Then you know I wouldn't worry about it. Then you could say, okay, the wild type or the knockout looks like you know a model sample. You could use you, know, you could just use one, but you would have your non-infected uh, wild type and you would have your um, infected wild type as your reference controls. Um, at most, you would have your wild type as a reference control, right? Wild type that has not been stimulated, your knockout that has not been stimulated, your wild type that has been added, uh, has had the virus added, and your knockout that has been added, um, has had the virus added. Those would be your four controls in total in that, in that experimental setup. Okay, and I think um, that addresses the questions in the chat box here. Yeah, all the chat box questions have been addressed. 